Jimmy K here, Metal Voice. Look at this. The Metal Voice shirts are now on sale. Just go to the video description to find out on how you can purchase one. Metal! Welcome to the Metal Voice today on the show. The one, the only, Mr. Glenn Drover. What's going on, buddy? Uh, not too much. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm great. I'm freezing my butt off in Montreal, Canada. It's minus 16 <laughs> degrees, but at least it's not too heavy on the snow. Not too heavy on the snow. Yeah. All yeah. Right. We have yeah zero so snow where I'm at, which is great. But although I do like to have snow sometimes. You know, I do like the connection, the Canadian connection, Glenn, you and your brother, Sean. You know, I know you were born in Ottawa. He was born in Montreal. So we have this sort of little family going in Canada. You know, we all know each other. It's really cool. Yep. You got it. All right. So the new project, very exciting, Walls of Blood Imperium, <laughs> will be <clears throat> released February 22nd on Metalville. All right. Yeah. Uh, Glenn Drover on guitars and keyboards, Scott Barrymore on drums. Chris Miles, a bass. There we go. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Um, all right. So first things first, why did you decide to do this project? Um, I, I started this. Actually, the project was actually started about six years ago. And what happened was for fun in between whatever I was doing at that point, yeah. uh, I, I got Henning Bossy to sing an old Eidolon song that I'd always loved but unfortunately it was destroyed by uh, mediocre vocals and that's being nice. Okay. And um, so I, I decided, you know what, send this over to, to, to Hanning, give him the lyrics, not the original music. So I don't want him to be listening to the, you know, the original um, melodies and stuff. And he loved it and he did the track and it came out killer. And then uh, shortly after that, moving to where I am now, um, I start I started talking to Todd from Queensryche yep. and, um, He's like, yeah, let's let's do a song. So that's that's kind of where it went. I was like, so I was like, you know what? what how about we do an album? <coughs> sorry, that'll have multiple guest singers on it. Yeah. You know, and 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 you know, ten songs, ten different singers, and that was the original design. But what ended up happening in the end was a couple of singers that didn't work out, which is actually, I mean, if you think about the odds, it worked out great because most of the singers did an amazing job. Yeah. And it was like, this is perfect. I don't want to touch it. It's great. And that's kind of a rarity, especially when you're doing long distance stuff. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that's that's basically what that was about. And, and also too to obviously try to make everything cohesive so that, you know, one song with this singer and, and, and yada yada, it's going to sound completely different. I think we did a good job in making everything sound real cohesive. So how would you describe the music for someone who hasn't heard the album? <laughs> Heavy metal. All right, pure heavy metal, that's it? it? It's pure heavy metal, yeah. There's some pretty heavy stuff on it, you know, but there's a lot of melody too. You know, there's a lot of good melody. It's not the typical thing that you, you've, you've heard the last 10, 15 years where, you know, all the singers sound, you know, they have that growly kind of thing. It's not like that at all. Okay. Even the guys, there's only a couple of songs where we have that, and they don't sound like any of those uh, of the, uh, <coughs> with all due respect, the cookie cutter things uh, that you're hearing. And, um, you know, like Matt did a killer job and, and Chuck has his own thing. Very identifiable. Yeah. yeah. So what about some lyrical themes on the album? So we got heavy metal uh, sound wise in terms of music. Well, what about the lyrical themes on this album? I'm hearing, I'm seeing leave this world behind, discordia, waiting to die. A lot of dying stuff happening. Walls of blood, a lot of gore. Give me some lyrical themes. That's what it is, basically. I mean, Sean, <laughs> Sean you know, Sean will write. It's you know it's just simple common sense. Okay. If the music is heavy, you're not going to write about chocolate. Yeah. So you're going to write something <laughs> that's going to reflect that. Sure. And that, that I think the music, the, the lyrics fl reflect, you know, the music, and that's what, where the inspiration came from. So it's not necessarily just trying to be, you know, doom and gloom. You know, it, it was just very fitting. And Sean's a great lyricist, so it's a no-brainer. We've always worked together on whatever since we were kids. And uh, nothing changes here. So, so to point out, Sean, Sean, your brother, did the lyrics or helped you write the lyrics for the whole album? Is that it? No, he wrote the lyrics for seven songs. And then we have an Alice in Chains song uh, cover. Yeah. And then uh, Todd, the one that he did, the Discordia song, he wrote the lyrics for that and all the melodies. And as uh, did um, Nils. Okay, Nils. 
He knows K. Ryu. Yeah. So he wrote the lyrics, and, and um, so so he Nils did his own thing, just like Todd did. Same idea. Took the music, wrote the lyrics, designed his own melodies. There you go. I mean, I should have premised this with, uh, you know, Todd Latore, Chuck Billy, Henning Nace, Tim Owens. These are, you know, some of this, some of the singers on this album. Some big names, right? What was your relationship like with Todd prior to this, to this, uh, this, this relationship? And this was, was this an older song that you and Todd were working on for, for a while? Discordia. We worked, we worked on it and perfected it over a, 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 a period of time, not too long, but I would say probably a couple of months or something. Okay. I, I think I already had the music, and it was just a, a question of getting all the lyrics down and um, and the melodies and, and critiquing and getting everything locked in. It, it, it didn't take too long. Um, did I know Todd before that? I don't think so. I don't think we've met before that. I might be wrong. My memory's bad. Okay. But I think that's how we initially met was through the conversations online to do uh, to do this out this song. Okay. And then I met, of course, after that, then I met him in Queensryche and, you know, blah, blah, blah. He's a really nice guy, Todd. He's one of the very polite, very kind. He's a very yeah, cool he, guy. He's, he's a great guy, great singer. Uh, you know, so it was it was a great vibe. It was really enjoyable. I mean, that's the thing. And I, I, I you know, some of us had learned that the hard way. And, you know, uh, uh, actually, probably a lot of us have where, you know, you do get, a, a, um, you know, a certain lineup of members and, you know, somebody's going to bring it down or maybe more than one. And it just makes it miserable uh, with this. It's been everything was was fun. There was no stress. You know, they're, they're all pros. They were all able to handle their own and accommodate the music and match it strength wise. Mm hmm. And that's all I could ever ask for. We we didn't always have that luxury in the early days. What, what but, uh, about... And it's, it's certainly something I could never do again. So you know, uh, and not just on whatever, but you know, now working with pros, that's I would never go any other way. Well, you're a pro, so you got to work with pros, right? That's how it comes down to. So that, that's what it uh, is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's just a reality. So Chuck Billy, tell me about your relationship with Chuck Billy. He does the song uh, "Waiting to Die," which is a brilliant song, by the way. Chuck really yeah. delivers. So tell me about your relationship with him and about the song, doing the song with him. Well, I mean, it started out with, I mean, you know, we met just kind of briefly, small talk on uh, festivals when I was at Bagadaf and, and Testament what might have been on the same festival, mm -hmm. festival, you know, be it in Spain or wherever it was, a lot of overseas festivals. And then there came a, a situation where uh, they were going to do some touring in South America with uh, Judas Priest. And Alex couldn't make it, couldn't make the gigs because he had some uh, commitment. I can't remember if it was TSO or it was his uh, uh, three-piece instrumental band. Okay. And Gary Holt, because I think they asked Gary first. And Gary's like, no, I got all this stuff. Like, he said, check out Glenn. Because Exodus, when I, on the first Megadeth tour I ever did, Exodus opened up. And we all became you know, really good friends. And they, were, they used to you know, throw me a lot of nice compliments and stuff like that, which was really cool. You know, especially from people you grew up listening to. Yep. And uh, that was always a cool thing. And um, my name came up. I said, yeah, you should, you should get Glenn. He's, he's left Megadeth. You got to get him. So uh, that's how I wound up doing that. Now it's basically, it, it's whenever there's a situation where Alex can't do the gig, I'm called in. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, All yeah. Right. About uh, Tim Ripper Owens now, he does the song... Uh, let me see what the tra it was. Tarnished Dream, which is a great song, and Tim's got a great voice. This guy's a real pro, right? I yeah. Mean, I know that you and Tim and your brother, you do Metal Nights. It's Metal Night, right? The Metal Night in Mon and Canada. a night of a night of metal. A night of metal. Sorry, sorry, sorry. You and Tim, mm -hmm. your brother, they do. You do a night of metal. Uh, I know you play gigs in Canada, Montreal, Toronto, Ottawa. So I mean, I, I get I, you guys have been friends forever. I'm assuming, right? Well, I mean, I first met Tim when. Um, I was asked to do some shows with Hale, you know, the band Hale that did all the, all the, this is, you know, basically the night of metal is kind of like that, you know, Hale is a band that has certain members like, uh, you know, I mean, there's been different, um, members come and go throughout the band, but you know, like you have, oh, it's just one typical one. You got the one, well, we'll just go off the one that I, I did sure. Paul from Slayer Testament, uh, uh, Testament forbidden mm -hmm. me from King Diamond. And um, Megadeth, James Lomenzo from Megadeth, and 
well, there was other bands, but we, we wanted to keep it metal. And uh, and Ripper, of course, Judas Priest is his big, you know, that's the big one for him. Yep. And um, that's, you know, you, you go out there and you play these songs from these bands we played in. And then the relative bands to that, you know, Sabbath, Iron Maiden, on and on and on, yep. you know. So it's a cover band, but it's 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 a little bit a different angle. You've got guys that were in these bands. Yeah. Yeah. And a night of metal is pretty much for the most part that we brought Adrian in who played with us and uh, did all the Eidolon albums. Um, he, he's a no brainer. He's just a great guy. And he's, you know, you never have to worry about him. So I was like, yeah, we got to get Adrian. Okay. And he loves doing it. So it's uh it's, it's a lot of fun. Oh, cool. Uh, so, I mean, the song itself, I mean, uh, what is it, like one take, Tim, one take, <laughs> and it was done? Did he I help no you with the song? I, I have no idea because I wasn't there. Oh, All really? The songs, none of the songs were recorded vocally in my studio. No, All no, the no. Stu- the stuff, yeah. yeah. But was it, All the I stuff mean, that was recorded in my studio were the drums, bass, guitars, keyboards, mixing. That's all, everything I did, All those, those were all the things that I did in my studio. Mastering was done by uh, Dave Otero, which uh, he did the mixing master for Sean's last uh, Act of Defiance album. He did a really good job. And I'm like, yeah, I got to get this guy. And he did a killer job in this album. So I'm really, really happy. Hey, tell me about touring this project. I mean, you, we talked about this prior to the interview. You're quite mm-hmm. not sure. Well, what are your thoughts? Mm-hmm. One singer doing well, your own? I, I kind of compare it to the Red Dragon car- cartel thing, mm-hmm. you know, where Jake, you know, uh, had formed a band, but yet he had different singers on there. Yep. Probably not. I, I, I'm not speaking for him because I don't know him or the situation, but I'm thinking that he was doing something um, just kind of testing the waters. He hadn't been in the industry for a long time, yep. especially with a full blown band, you know, since Badlands, actually, I, I think with vocals and you know, just complete band. And um, probably wanted to see where it was going to go, you know, do a tour, see how it's recept, what, what, what the reception's like, and blah blah blah. And mm-hmm. it turned out really, really positive and really good. And um, you know, and then you decide, I guess, with the second one, okay, I want to record it the way I want to record it, more old school, um, and just you know, just the lineup, no, no guest singers or, or players, or you know, just focusing on the band itself. And um, that's possible. Sure. I'm open to anything that makes sense. How about that? All right. Cool. 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 Yeah. And let's just dive into the past a bit because I know a lot of people want to hear about Megadeth and King Diamond, your years with them, if that's okay with you. Uh, United Abominations. Probably one of my favorite Megadeth albums, by the way. I, mm. just, I just love that album. I love the guitar work. I love the the melody. When you look back at that album today, what do you think? Uh, for United Abominations, I think, it's a re- I think it came out really well. It's a very strong album. Um, there's songs on there that I, I, I favor more than others. Um, you know, but I mean, saying that, I think it's all great. You know, the whole album is a, is a really good cohesive package and, uh, it was a lot of fun to record it. Um, my preference, you know, listening to Megadeth albums would be those first three, uh, especially so far so good and, uh, peace cells. But, um, saying that, um, there's a lot of songs I do like on it. So, it's just there's there's certain ones that, that didn't you know do a whole lot for me, but that's just my opinion, which is what we want. We want people to have their own opinions and have them all different. That's what makes the world go round. When you were doing your solos on that album, was uh, I know Mustaine was saying that he was sort of singing the melodies to Mar- uh, Marty you know, Friedman. That, that's, that, that, that was kind of taken to uh, a weird place. Really? Where? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, he, he had said that, but I think the problem was D- Dave didn't really specify. So it made it sound like he literally sang all the notes, but that's not what it was. Um, like for example, for, for me, yeah, uh, I can really only speak for me, but I know it was kind of the same idea with the rest of them. Is that um, I remember doing this one so- solo, mm-hmm. and the first song is called Sleepwalker. Yep, yeah, I know Sleepwalker. That, that wasn't going to make the album. Thank God it did because it's pretty much one of the, the very few up tempo tracks. Too many of the songs were were just mid tempo, and a little bit more kind of, you know, laid back. And we needed something that was going to be more of a, a faster hit you in the head type of song. And um, Dave didn't want to do it. And in the end, what happened was um, me and Andy Sneap did a demo of it and sent it to the record company. We're like, yeah, we're using this one. 
<laughs> so I sure. guess Dave was overpowered on that. Sorry, Dave, but uh, that's that, I think that's how the story went. And I mean, a tout le monde, right? They redo it. I mean, when you when they said we're going to redo this song, was it like, mm. okay, why are we redoing this? Uh, well, how- you know, for, for me, I, I was always more into the more obscure, you know, stuff from P cells like Black Friday and Devil's Island and blah blah blah, and a lot of stuff off. So far, so good. So what? That I love that album. You know, there's you know classic songs in that album, and um. But I thought, okay, well, you know, we'll see how it goes. Then they brought in, uh, what's her name, to do the uh, call and answer stuff, I guess, if you want to call it that. Yeah. And um, and then they, he wanted me to do the solo, as you hear it on the original album, mm-hmm. but then add something to it. So we extended, some, we extended it, and then I added something to it. Okay. So that's basically what the song's about. For the most part, it's, it was Dave's thing. I, I co-wrote a part of a song. Yeah. That song turned out really well. That was another song that wasn't going to wind alone. up. Great song, yeah. That wasn't going to be on the album initially. Like the original version album that I uh, version of the album that I have is different okay. than the uh, the the uh, final copy. Um, a little bit too laid back. Um, so the record company were not impressed with uh, the producer's work at the time, and uh, neither was I, or and maybe some other people. And um, we needed somebody who was really to understand where the band needed to go, get that aggression back, you know, and not all this kind of laid back brown guitar sounds. And, you know, so we thank God we got rid of that. And then we got Andy Sneap on board yeah. and he brought it to life, you know. So it was all the existing songs, which we polished up, strengthened all, all those songs up. And then we added like two or three. I think there was two. There might have been a third one, but I, I'm certain of two, which were the first two no. What was the first two songs on the album? Sleepwalker and Washington is next. Oh, okay, so the third song. Never Walk Alone is the third song, yeah. Right, right. But great, I mean, the first side, one, two, three, four, five, if you're asking me, like, those those first five tracks are killer. Yeah. But that's like just all, me. That's just me. Yeah, I like I, American I like, Stand. I like, all those, I like all those songs, too. Yeah, I yeah. do. I think it's killer. I there was know, even I one near the end. Um, Burnt Ice. You're dead. Yeah, but there's one near the end. Um, I still like it. I had a vision of it turning out a little bit different, but this what was one of the early songs me and Dave used to rehearse a lot. Yep. Um, and it's the one called you're dead. Yep. You're dead. But if you listen to the music, there's a lot of really cool intri- intricate, you know, throwback to older Megadeth stuff. And for me, that was really exciting. I'm like, I'm, I'm really looking forward to where this is going. And it came out good. Um, but I, I love the music uh, for sure. Good, good. Uh, for me, I, I I really like the album. It's it's, it's a very post nine eleven type album in a sense, right? It's mm-hmm. there's a lot of anger there, and uh, there's a lot sure. of political and social commentary there, and yeah, you know, that's what I like about the album. It's 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 it's. I think Dave does a great job. I think you do a great job. You know, Thank I, you. I, I think it's better than fo- so far so good. So what? But that's just me. God no, that's, that's just me. Up. But that's just me. I'm allowed, right? <laughs> I'm allowed. I'm allowed. I'll keep my. I'll, I'm just gonna keep my mouth shut. <laughs> You should, yes. Uh, uh, no, I mean it's you know it's awesome. I, I get I've had so many people you can't count that high that have sent me personal messages saying, oh, you know my favorite album is that one, and and uh, you know really like your lead work and blah blah blah. So it's it's really cool. I'm I'm glad that I'm part of an album. Yeah. That people look back and like it, and 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 unfortunately some of the albums are you know didn't turn out that way as we know. Yeah. Well. Um... So, I mean, and, and just to s- close off, I mean, I, I've, I've spoken to Dave Mustaine. I've spoken to Elfson. What's it mm-hmm. like? And I always ask guys when, in Megadeth, what was it like in the studio where they, was it sort of like, okay, do another solo, do another solo, or they just let you have the freedom to express Not yourself? Not really. No, you know, Dave, I got along with him really well. He wasn't a taskmaster with me. You know, do this 5,000 times over. Um, I did my homework so much that uh, he really didn't question a whole lot. And when it came to solos, I'd do something. He goes, why don't you try something like this? And always the idea he would come and going back to that whole thing about singing, um, the, the singing of the solos. He's not singing all the notes. He's kind of like going, nah, 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 nah. he, he kind of like mimic like the, the, the actual the melody, the flow, the flow of it, the tempo of it, you know. And uh, it was kind of like that because I remember in Sleepwalker, the first solo, the original solo I did was it was like twice as fast. He's like, yeah, it's it's. It's it's good, but maybe let's why don't we do something 
where it's a little bit more slower paced and it's more memorable, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, okay. And then he went down and that's what he did. I'm like, okay. And that's what we did. We, I worked on that, got all the choice notes and there you go. And that made the album. Okay. So it was actually a really good working atmosphere. I did most of my solos actually at Andy's studio in the UK. And it was just me, Dave and, and Andy in the studio at that point. We just flew in all the other guys that already finished their stuff. The drums were done. This was at the end of the album because we recorded and actually four or five different studios. Okay. Believe it or not. All right. Okay. Last part. And you know, one of my favorite bands, King Diamond. I, you know, I, I speak to Andy LaRock all the time. I speak to King. I mean, looking back at those years, right? The King Diamond years and, and House of God. Was it a positive experience, a negative experience? Or, you know, was it just so-so experience? How do you feel about that album? No, it was, it was an amazing experience. You got to remember something here. My first Merciful Fate album oh. that I bought was Don't Break the Oath when it came out in, in, in 84. Gotcha. <clears throat> I heard bits and pieces of Melissa, and I didn't get it. And then I got Don't Break the Oath, knowing that was the second album, and I just didn't get it at the time. But of course, you know, at this time, I was listening to Rat and Ozzy and Dawkin, and you know, things were a lot safer. So you got it was definitely way out of, in, in left field. Um, but there was something intriguing there, but I just, I couldn't quite get my head around it right away. And it wasn't until the first King Diamond album came out. That's where I really started to get into it. And I got all my friends into it and the whole bit. And, um, so I became a huge fan, you know, and then we get to them, you know, those are magical days when you get an album and you play it and you get goosebumps and you're freaked out. I mean, that's, that's, that's a rarity. I'll never forget those moments though. And, um, that's my favorite album, of course. And um, so time passes on. I got the gig because I sent an audition tape earlier on, early 90s. And uh, I got the gig, and I was like, you know, I was blown away. I was still living at home. I was really young. And um, it, it, was a, oh, it was an amazing experience. I mean, you know, King was always great to me because we kept in contact after I sent him a demo in the early 90s. And we just kept in contact, talking to his friends and, blah, blah, blah. And then the situation came up in 97 and he called me and goes, Hey, you want a job? And, uh, that was that. So, um, it was, it was always great. Everybody was, we all got along really well together. Um, you know, certain people I gravitated a little bit more to, and I would say that was probably more Andy King and, and Oli, who was the manager. Those were the top guys. All, everybody was cool, but those were my three favorite people that, I think I related to most of mm -hmm. most uh, 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 as comparison to maybe some of the others. Johnny Bear was great too. What was, what was the recording process like? I mean, you have King there, you have Andy there, you know, I'm mm. sure they played a huge role like Dave Mustaine used to, right? What was the experience well, was, like? Well, they kind of do it in a way where <clears throat> when King does his vocals, um, he just wants, uh, it's just him and the producer and the engineer. That, that's, that's it. I, maybe Andy's in there sometimes, but that's primarily the, the only people that are in there. So it's not like a big band thing. Andy likes to do his guitar tracks alone. When I go in, I don't give a shit who's there. I just, you know, I'm just going to play solos and, and do whatnot. And uh, I just went in and had a lot of fun. They flew me into to, to Dallas um, and spent two weeks just doing all my solos. You know, I, I would do three or four a day. Then I go back to the hotel that night and work out the songs for the next day and I go in and we do those and until the album was done. Actually, I don't know. I think it was a week. Okay. It was a cool experience. It was my first, my very first, uh, musical instrument endorsement, which was Jackson guitars. Cool. You know, that my rep at the time, Kevin Easton came in, here you go, man. Here's your, you know, we, we talked about making a guitar that's similar to an old Charvel that I have. And, and he, duplicate it as much as he could it was a killer guitar i used that on a lot of recordings um so you know there was great times all the touring i have a lot of great memories uh, you know yeah uh, i had to leave a little bit earlier than i wanted to but my you know my my, my lifestyle had changed i got married i had a kid on the way you know i couldn't just rely on the uh you know sporadic touring that would happen here and there you know, and then getting a, a proper job, you know, they weren't going to go for, hey, by the way, I got to leave for two months. Uh, no, <laughs> you 
You know what I mean? Yeah, no, no, so, I, yeah, I get you. But I mean, yeah. l- looking back now, now you have the, the, you can look back, you know, and, and Megadeth, King Diamond, would you have said, would you have said, you know what, I could have stayed on for one more album. Maybe I could have made the change or, you know, because, uh, you know, we look back and said, you know, I, I've talked to a lot of artists, by the way, and they tell me I should have stuck around for at least one more album or one more tour or something. Do you, do you have any regrets looking back? No, I don't have any regrets because I'm not sure how much of a difference it really would have made. Um, the album that was made after I left mm-hmm. was, I think, Abigail 2. Yeah. And um, that came out okay. Um, I would say the House of God album is a little stronger. I think so, too. Um, all due respect to that one, because there's a lot of good stuff on there, too. Um, I, I, it was I, Again, there was a lot of personal reasons, uh, which is some of the, the ones I just told you. And um, I was really content with doing that. And um, also, Sean and I, with our Eidolon band, got signed to Metal Blade yeah, yeah. when I joined King Diamond. <clears throat> so we were pretty cool <clears throat> trying to, to build that band. You know, um, so I, okay, like, we'll stick to that. I mean, I, I gained that experience. It was amazing. We have this stuff to fall back on. Um, again, you know, my son was really, really young. I didn't want to be on tour all the time. Um, I ended up doing that a little bit anyways later on because of the Megadeth thing. But that wasn't, you know, that was that was just a fluke thing that just came up. Well, I don't know if it's a fluke thing. But no, it, it wasn't some, a fluke. It, no, wasn't. it wasn't a fluke. That was the wrong choice of word. Um, I was referred by somebody who I knew and um, everything fell into place. That's and I busted my ass and I was in great shape, both physically, mentally, playing wise. I was ready. When I got there, I might have had to retweak a few things from Dave as, oh, okay, you're playing it like this. But I went in there with my homework done times 10. I wasn't taking this lightly. Yeah. So apparently I went in and made a pretty good impression, which is uh, Dave turned around and said, because Nick, th- things weren't working out with Nick. He said, you know, I'm assuming that your brother's cut from the same cloth. Let's get him in. <laughs> and he did. And Sean had like six or seven days to learn the whole set, which was that. That's a good story in itself. Yeah, yeah. Well, Sean's great. I mean, I, I spoke yeah. to Sean. Yeah, well, he, he, he's, he's like a rock. And he's a sponge, too. And, and he's a professional, he a complete yeah. professional. He sponges what he needs to learn. But when he's got it, he's like a rock. Yeah. You don't have to look back at him. Of course, for me, some other people did. But for me, I never had to because I've been playing with him since I was 10. So I know him like the back of my hand. Absolutely. What a great lineup. I know what he's, know what he's going to do. I know how to lock up with him tighter than anybody. Yep. You know, and that was really a big part of that lineup too, you know, was the tightness that me and Sean had that we brought to the band really made a difference. Yeah. That's why I was. it's a shame you weren't around for longer. That's how I look at it. That's all. Well, yeah, there was, for, yeah, there was issues that came up. I had to go at that point. I was, I, I, I couldn't have stayed any longer because of what was going on, and I didn't have any regrets. You know, I did for, for the most part. I mean, I had my days, you know, but for the most part, I knew I did the right thing. Had I stayed in there longer, there might have been more problems. Um, but I, 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 uh, I left when I had to, and, and that was that. All right. Well, so, I think I think on that note, everybody go pick up Walls of Blood, pre-order it if you can. Imperium going to be released February twenty second on Metalville. Glenn yeah, Drover. it's gonna, it's Metalville in in the U S. and in uh, overseas, I guess for Scandinavia and wherever else. But in Canada, I, I actually actually uh, it's going to be Universal Music. Oh, cool! Very good. Yes, nice. and it's going to be on CD, digital download, of course, and vinyl. Very, very cool. So it's going to be released on all those good uh, different mediums. And, um, you know, I, I everybody says the same thing, but I can easily say with all confidence, and anybody who, who hears it will agree, it's the strongest thing I think I've ever been a part of with anything. You know, as far as a consistent, really strong album, all the songs are strong. I think I nailed it on the head. Easy. Well, I heard it, and I think you nailed it on the head too. And I, I, I would tell everybody... When you play this album, make sure to play it on some, you know, nice speakers because this song, it's got a wall of sound of metal. That's what I think. Yeah. Uh, and the diversity of all the great singers. And there's a lot of great singers on this album. So I yeah. think everybody will very much, very enjoyable, very enjoyable. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for being a guest, Glenn. And we will talk soon. See you on tour.
Yeah, thank you very much as well.